At the end of this online module, you should be able to state the purpose of linear regression analysis, present in equation form the coefficients of a best fit linear model using least squares method, define, explain the use of, and relate SSE, SST, and R squared, interpret the slope and intercept of a best fit linear model, interpret the R squared value, and use the best fit linear model to make predictions only when appropriate. Let's consider a problem for which we will need to use linear regression. A pen company is designing a new ballpoint pen style, but the inkwell retraction mechanisms continue to fail quality checks. They assigned an engineer to evaluate the spring constant of the mechanism's springs to see if spring strength is the problem. The engineer performed force and displacement tests on the springs and wants to determine the spring constant. The test data can be seen in this graph. In order to work on this problem, we will need to understand a little bit about springs. Let's consider Hooke's law. Hooke's law is the relationship between the force F required to stretch or compress a spring and the length x of the elongation or compression. The relationship is f equals kx. Notice that this is a linear relationship. The slope of the line is k and represents a constant characteristic of the spring itself, called the spring constant, that can be used to determine the stiffness of the spring. The y-intercept is zero, which is when the spring is in its neutral state and is neither elongated nor compressed. What does that mean for the spring data collected by the engineer? The data show a system with a linear relationship between force and spring displacement only within a certain range. The relationship is nonlinear outside that range, so Hooke's law only applies within the linear range of the data. This means we can use the experimental data to find the spring constant for the retraction mechanism springs using a linear model, but only within the range where the data are linear. So what is linear regression? Regression is used to model a dependent variable from one or more independent variables. In this class, we will focus on bivariate data, or data involving one independent and one dependent variable. These variables can be related in various ways. There is a key assumption we make when doing linear regression analysis, and that is that we assume that one of the variables is a function of the other variable. Here are some reasons we use linear regression and some relevant examples. The amount a rubber band stretches when we pull on it is a cause and effect relationship. If we don't pull on it, the rubber band doesn't stretch at all. Another example is measuring temporal changes, that is, changes over time. For example, we might measure the change of temperature of a cup of coffee over time. Time is not causing the coffee to cool. A temperature difference between the coffee and the surrounding air is causing that. But we can still model the temperature as a function of time. We can also use linear regression for predictive purposes, such as predicting college grades from pre-college grades or test scores. Finally, we can look for correlations within data using linear regression. When we find correlations, we must remember that they are not necessarily cause and effect relationships. For example, over a large enough sample, mathematics performance is correlated with height. A more careful exploration reveals that this relationship is due to the fact that both height and mathematics performance tend to increase with age. Coming back to our example, we can see that the data are not all linearly related. The spring constant k is only derived from the range of data in the spring that has not been compressed or stretched too far. So we only use the data shown here. Hooke's law indicates that the spring constant k is the slope of the line where x, the displacement of the spring, is the independent variable, and f, the directional force on the spring, is the dependent variable. Here we have the data plotted from the spring, and we can see there is a linear relationship. Using linear regression, we can model the data with a line. Once a line is determined, we use the slope of the line to identify our spring constant k. So how can we find an equation of this line? A common method to find a best fit line is least squares regression. Let's discuss the mathematics behind the model of least squares regression. Least squares regression is a method to determine a best fit line f of x equals ax plus b with coefficients a and b that minimize the sum of the squared errors between the model and the data. The sum of squares due to error or SSE, measures how well a model line, in our case f of x, matches the actual data. So this means that the goal of least squares regression is to find the values of the slope and y-intercept of a line that minimize the sum of squared errors. Here is a simpler form of the equation for SSE. It states that you sum the square of the error term. So what's the error term? The error term for the ith data point, e sub i, is the distance in the y direction between each data point's y value, y sub i, which is the actual y value of the point, 
and the corresponding y value for the modeled line f of x sub i, which is the expected y value which comes from the modeled line. You can see in the graph that the error term highlighted is represented by the length of the black line on the graph. The error term is calculated by taking the difference of the y value of the ith data point and the y value of the modeled line for the same x sub i. Therefore, the error term e sub i is the same as the y sub i term subtracted by the f of x sub i term for each point. When we substitute this in for e sub i, we get the version of the SSE equation first shown. So why squares of the errors rather than just summing the error terms? Look at the graph at the right. Notice that some of the data points are below the line. Therefore, the calculated error might be negative. Since we don't want negative errors to cancel out positive ones, we square all the individual error terms. Then we sum them up to calculate the sum of squared errors. This is an important term that we will use now and again later in our goodness of fit. It represents the variance in the data that is not explained by the model. Now we know that our goal is to minimize the sum of squared errors in order to do least squares regression. So what errors are we minimizing? The errors are the difference between the actual measured data and our guess that is determined by our model line. So the error is how far off our model is from the reality of the data values. These errors are not anything about the accuracy or precision of the measurement of either the independent or dependent variables. These errors do not have anything to do with how well the data were collected, and they are not noise in the data. We will use SSE to find the equation of our model line using least squares regression. Here we have our SSE equation, and our goal is to find values of the slope A and the y-intercept B that minimize the SSE. But where are the a and b in the SSE? Remember the error term. Since f of x sub i is the same as a x sub i plus b, we can substitute this into the error term equation. In the same way, we can also just replace the f of x sub i with a x sub i plus b in the SSE equation to get an SSE that is ready to be minimized with respect to a and b. Minimizing suggests that we will use derivatives. So let's look at how to minimize SSE with respect to A and to B. We will use a form of derivatives called partial derivatives. Partial derivatives are used when there is more than one variable in the equation and you wish to minimize with respect to just one of them. For simplicity's sake, in this equation, I have replaced SSE with the variable Z. Let's start with minimizing Z with respect to the slope A. This will give us an equation where only A and B are unknowns when we set it equal to zero to minimize it. We begin by taking the z equation and taking the derivative with respect to a. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here because you are not responsible to be able to replicate this derivation. But to help you see it, this uses the chain rule and pretends that a is the only variable and all other letters are constants. I also did some algebraic manipulation to bring the negative outside the summation notation. And finally, we set this equation equal to zero. Next, I will rearrange the equation algebraically by dividing both sides by negative two and doing some distribution. Finally, I will pull out the slope a and the y-intercept b and move the constant term to the other side of the equal sign. Okay, so what does that do? Here I show you an animation of what the partial derivative with respect to slope does. Notice that on the left graph, the line is fixed with a spot on the y-intercept, but that the slope is changing. As it moves, it gets closer to modeling the data and then farther away. But look at what the graph of the error term z versus the slope a does. Remember our goal was to minimize the error term, so when the parabola is at its vertex, we get our minimum. Notice this is also where the line on the left appears to model the data the best. Now we use the z equation, and taking the derivative with respect to the y-intercept b. Again, it uses the chain rule and pretends that b is the only variable and all other letters are constants. I will rearrange the equation algebraically. Finally, I will pull out the slope a and y-intercept b and move the constant term to the other side of the equal sign. Okay, so what does this do? Here, I show you a similar animation showing what the partial derivative with respect to the y-intercept does. Notice that on the left graph, the slope stays the same, but the y-intercept is changing effectively moving the line up and down. As it moves, it gets closer to modeling the data well, then farther away. But look at what the graph of the error term z versus the y-intercept does. Remember our goal was to minimize the error term, so when the parabola is at its vertex, we get our minimum. And again, notice this is where the line on the left graph appears to model the data the best. Now we have these two equations with two unknowns a and b. 
The x's, y's, and n's are calculated from the data. We could use these equations like this and plug the numbers in, then solve the two equations with two unknowns. But we can also simplify it further. The equations on the left are the ones we just calculated. We can use substitution and a lot of tedious algebraic manipulation and arrive at the equations on the right. These equations for least squares regression are the slope equation, a equals x bar times y bar, which is symbolism for the mean, minus xy bar, all divided by the quantity x bar squared minus x squared bar, and the y-intercept equation is b equals y bar minus a times x bar. If you are interested, you can see how to derive these equations in detail at Khan Academy. Their proof, parts 1 through 4, of minimizing least squares regressions takes you through this algebraic manipulation. These simplified equations are the equations that we will use in this course. Once we have a model for our data, we must understand when and how to use the model to predict outcomes. Let's revisit our springs data as an example. The data, or relationship between variables, may have limitations that will also affect when you can or should use the model. The linear model f equals kx has limits due to the physical properties of the spring. Here we see a line that models the blue data. Notice that if we continue the line beyond the blue data, the dotted lines no longer seem to be a good fit. That is because an overly stretched or compressed spring will eventually fail, and the linear model cannot describe that behavior. As an example of why this is true, consider this scenario. Can a spring return to its original shape if you stretch it to its limit until it is straight? This takes the spring to failure, so the spring constant is no longer relevant. It is very important that you always consider the context of the data as you may not know what happens outside of the range of data. For this reason, care must be taken when extrapolating a regression relationship beyond the data used to create it. Depending on your knowledge of the system, extrapolation may be inappropriate, or it may be reasonable within limits. Certainly, the use of extrapolation should always come with a rationale. Let's assume at this point we have determined the slope of our modeled line for the spring, and we have an equation for which we have a numerical value for k. A good model will increase our confidence that the value for k is valid for our data. So how do we know if this model is a good approximation? In this course, we will use the following conventional goodness of fit models. The sum of squares due to errors, which we have already described, is a measure of how well the model predicts the dependent variable. The sum of squares of the deviations, or the total sum of squares, is a measure of how much variability is present in the original dependent variable. And the coefficient of determination is a ratio, or percent measure, of how much variability in the data can be explained by the model. We will learn about each of these measures individually. Just as a reminder, the sum of squares due to error, or SSE, measures how well our prediction matches the actual data. Because a low SSE means the model fits the data well, you can think of SSE as measuring how poorly our model matches the data. It measures the amount of variance in the data that the model cannot explain. You can use SSE as a goodness of fit measure, whether we use least squares regression or some other form of linear regression such as the two-point method you likely learned in your previous schooling. We also want to understand if the data have enough variance to be useful to us. One way to consider whether or not the data have enough variance is to compare the y values of the data to the mean of all the y values, which is y bar. But why should we compare the y values of our data to the mean of the y values? Because the mean of the y values of the data is the predicted y value no matter what x value we are considering. Because of this, we call this variance the total variance, or the sum of squares total, or SST. Here we see the equation for SST. Notice it is similar to SSE, except we are looking at the total deviations from the mean. Notice in the graph that the difference between a single data point's y value and y bar could be positive or negative, so again we square each difference. SST measures the variability in the actual data. If SST is small, then the data are not too much different than the mean. This means that there's only a little bit of deviation from the mean of the y values for each data point, and therefore the independent and dependent variable are not related. If this value is large, then the data deviate a lot from the mean. This may or may not mean that the independent and dependent variable are related. SST alone is not enough to verify the relationship. Because SST considers the deviation from the mean, SST is also sometimes called the sum of the squares of deviations. We will use both names, sum of squares total and sum of squares of the deviations, in this course. Neither SSE, the sum of the square of the errors, 
nor SST, the sum of squares total, give us all the information that we want, but we can use the relationship between SSE and SST to measure the proportion of how well our model fits the data. This expression is called the coefficient of determination and is referenced as R squared. R squared is determined using the equation shown here. R squared is interpreted as the ratio of the variance in the dependent variable that is predictable from the independent variable. Another way to say this is that since SSE divided by SST is the fraction of the variance in the data that the model does not explain, we subtract that fraction from 1 to calculate the fraction of variance that the model does explain, which makes a lot more sense. Notice in the graph that we calculate SST using the deviation terms like what is shown in blue. Then for SSE, we calculate the error terms like what is shown in black. Even though what is shown here is the actual error and deviation terms rather than the sum of squares, you can see a ratio still exists between SSE and SST and represents the fraction that the model does not explain. When we take that fraction from 1, the new value, which is R squared, is the percentage of the variance that can be explained by our model. Let's go into a little more detail about how to interpret the coefficient of determination R squared. Again, the R squared value is a measure of the extent to which a model explains the variation that exists in the data. It varies between 0 and 1. The closer this value is to 1, the better the model line fits our data. If R squared is small, this does not indicate a small error. A small SSE indicates a small amount of error. And finally, like SSE, R squared can only measure the fit of the model to its data. It does not indicate anything about the measurement of the actual data. Okay, so let's go back to our example. Let's say for our ballpoint pen spring being tested, the engineer has calculated the SSE to be 1 and the SST to be 4. The R squared value is calculated using 1 minus SSE over SST. So we plug in our values of SSE and SST and the result is 75 one hundredths. This means that the model line explains 75% of the variation that exists in the data. That's a fairly good fit of the model to the data. I bet at this point you're asking yourself, why R squared and not R? The reason is that we are transformed in the squared space due to SSE and SST being squared values. So what is R and what's it useful for? R is called the correlation coefficient and is the measurement of the strength and direction of the correlation between the independent and dependent variables. To calculate R, just undo the transformation discussed above by taking the square root of R squared. The value of R varies from negative 1 to 1. An R value close to 0 means that there's very little correlation between the variables. The strength of the relationship increases as you move away from 0, either toward 1 or negative 1. Since the square root of R squared can be positive or negative, how do you know if your model has a positive or negative R value? A positive R refers to a direct relationship between the variables, which means an increase in the X variable tends to result in an increase in the Y variable. This results in the model having a positive slope. In the same way, a negative R refers to an indirect relationship, and therefore results in the model having a negative slope. In this course we will use R squared often, but you are still responsible for understanding the correlation coefficient R as well. Here's a summary of this online module. We learned that linear regression models data using a line, and least squares regression is one way to calculate a regression line and uses these equations. Linear regression models may have mathematical or physical limitations, so be careful of using a model outside of the range of values through which the model was created. There are several conventional goodness of fit models that determine how well a model line fits the data. The sum of squares due to errors is a measure of how well the model predicts the dependent variable. The sum of squares of the deviations, or the total sum of squares, is a measure of how much variability is present in the original dependent variable. And the coefficient of determination is a ratio or percent measure of how much variability in the data can be explained by the model.